Hello and welcome back to another episode of me mucking around with the Push 3 uh, and Max for Live. A uh, quick couple of things before we start. Um, this is now going to be version 1.1 of the Push 3 Control Master. So if you've downloaded version 1, I'll be adding this to the zip file uh, and uploading it. Now I'm going to keep the versions separate. So if you've watched an older video and you don't particularly want to go on the same path as I discover new things, then you can use the, the corresponding device. A couple of shout outs as well. Uh, I've got Aaron Levitz got in touch and actually improved on the the code that's used to check which particular track that this device sits upon uh, so that it works whether it's uh, on a return track or even within a rack itself uh, and another one I've got a shout out to is uh, Oliver of 11olson.de uh, who's provided the floating window code that I'll show you in a moment now I'm going to move across to a track uh, let's just uh, check I've got my grab and release, yeah, grab, release. So you've seen that all before, navigating to the device and actually, you know, uh, grabbing hold of things. So let's go to this second track over here, which is obviously an audio track. So because it's an audio track, if I press the note button, then effectively it's going to grab this surface. But you'll notice there's a little red light that's uh, popped up there because I've actually programmed this now. It's only actually got one mode as it stands, but effectively what this is gonna do, if you're on an audio track and you select the audio button, it's going to search for a device that is called Isotonic. Now you can change the name of the device within the track, uh, sorry, within the device, and this has been really maximized for use with an audio track because the red dot here, and in fact, all of these buttons are selectors for the chain selector of this particular rack, which means you could put in effects, 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 effects up to 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48 uh, chains on this particular one. And the top two rows, as you can see, allow you to play your macros. Now that's working effectively on a momentary basis and based on how hard I press the pad because it's working on velocity. Now I can set this up uh, slightly differently. So if I go across and uh, I pop open the floating window um, from Oliver, I've actually got some controls in there. Now, because obviously a floating window is great if you're using this as a controller with live, I've also started to put these in the macros. And what you actually have, uh, and we've obviously moved track here, um, I've still got control, but I've now got control of the rack called Isotonic that's on this track. So it dynamically maps to the track that's in focus. And I've got just the controls for this first button uh, on the window. One of the things that will happen with these videos is I won't have the complete feature set completed because as long as I get to a Saturday and it's the point where my wife goes out to the gym for an hour or so, I get the chance to record what I've uh, come up with in the week. But this is effectively this one button here and I can set this to velocity as you saw there, depending how hard I press, depends how, how high the macro goes. I can set it to toggle. So one press turns it on, another press turns it off. I can also set the minimum and maximum. So it's now going to toggle between two different values. And what I need to complete is momentary, which effectively will be the same as that first uh, type being the velocity. So when I press, it goes up. When I release, it goes down based on the minimum maximum. But the momentary will effectively only ever work at 35 and 74. Now, if you are using the desktop and this device is working for you well as a controller, this floating window, and the reason I love it so much, has two features. One, it's going to hide itself when the track is not in view and bring itself to the forefront. It's also always going to be on top so I can click around as long as I'm on the track. And the beauty of this is that it automatically zooms to the right side. 
Now, as we progress with these videos, what I'm going to be doing is releasing effectively two versions. One is going to be the free version of the device, the Push 3 Control Master. Uh, and the second one, which will be a premium device, is going to build over a period of time uh, into a full performance template. That'll include all of the racks, all of the mappings and that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, the completed code. But I'll always continue supporting the Push 3 Control Master uh, as you can dive into it. And uh, by all means, comment on the video below of stuff that you think I should be clearer on etc etc and uh, we'll get there so let's close this down let's have a look in the code and we'll see how we've achieved that as you can see my credits are going to start building here and if you think as 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 both uh, Oliver and Aaron got in touch that there's a better way of doing things please let me know uh, we can share we can all get better at doing this so let me unfreeze and I'm going to find where I did all of this stuff okay so uh, 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 I think it's down here there we go so this is basically the current track ID. So we, we looked at that previously. It will basically get the ID of the currently highlighted track. We're going to send a get devices through to that track, route the devices into this m4l.api.get device names. Now, I think we had a look earlier, but there are a set of Max for Live abstractions that are available. Um, but these have been pretty much static uh, since day one. Uh, and one thing that it was uh, pointed out to me was if I go to right click and paste from Max for Live, I now have a huge amount of abstractions that I, I can use. So building blocks of code uh, such as uh, select previous scene, select set, set selected scene index, etc. But I also have these live API choosers. Let's uh, let's do this one. Brails device parameters, and what it does is basically they generally always need a bang to get started. But if I bang these, then let's lock there, enable me to basically find stuff and then look at all of the macros, etc., that are within the device. And of course, each of these elements are little building blocks, so you can pull them apart and start to use them in your own devices. I'm sure there's going to be some more improvement on this in, in coming uh, weeks and months, um, but it's a great feature if you're, if you're learning how to get around with the, the live API effectively. So those device names are being spat out of there, and at that point, I'm looking for one that is called isotonic effectively so as soon as that happens that match is going to bang it's going to take that id out and it's going to send it to this live object so it's now going to be focused on the isotonic rack it's going to be sending out the parameters it's going to root them group them put a counter together so effectively it's going to take the uh zero one two three four five parameter and add the id on the end of it i'm then going to create a message called target and the target will be the number of the parameter followed by the id of the parameter and then that's going to go into this poly device uh now the Poly is a really great way of dealing with multiple voices uh, if you use an MPE and that kind of thing. But I use it quite a lot when I'm working on uh, a single patcher that I need to focus on a lot of parameters. So this actually has 18 voices. Uh, the first one is going to be to the off on button. So I'm ignoring that effectively. Um, but inside here, if I double click, I've annotated this and basically I'm sending in the details of the individual parameter. Uh, in this case, that's uh, this first one. So effectively, that then uh, is my patch for taking control of that first parameter and then accepting the button presses to change that. And then importantly, when I do the grab and release, it packs the last value together and sends it out to do the lighting. Now, in this particular version, I've chosen not to use a live observer because effectively that might be using CPU all of the time. But 
I'm only going to be doing singular uh, presses rather than bi-directional um, because my intent of this would be that I would be controlling uh, another device with the encoders and be able to play this rack um, in addition to it. So I've got double set of controls effectively. That little patch there is receiving all of the detail that came from our floating window, which effectively is the minimum, the maximum, and the, the type of uh, control. But it's also getting, uh, sorry, I'm also creating the uh, lighting for the particular um, set of buttons that are down here, which is the chain selector, because these are basically going to go into their named polys, which will focus on the um, the macros. This one goes into would, if it was just directly connected, would go into the chain selector. And so I'd only be able to control that by the velocity of pressing that one button. So instead, I've bypassed that and I've uh, split that control into these, which is, is something that I'm going to use in another scene. So for this video, oh, cancel one second for this video uh, you'll find it all down the bottom effectively and uh, this is where we are probably going to leave things in one route because i've now only got effectively one set of controls on this button matrix and i'd like to be able to do some more so i'm going to start to look at how i can use perhaps uh, another combination of keys maybe with with these up here and the shift button to switch between different sets of functionality uh, and i might like to bring this touch strip in at one point so if there's other things you'd like me to to have a look at please let me know, stick it in the comments below, and uh, I'll try and keep these videos short and sweet each time. Hit 12 minutes. Thanks for watching. See you next time.